Hello everybody and welcome to the Alien vs Predator Galaxy podcast. This is regular host Aaron Percival and I'm joined by regular partner in crime. No more thing, otherwise known as Eric Adams. And for this episode we've... <laughs> okay, so one of the things I always tend to bring up on the show is that this is an Alien vs Predator show. We don't get to talk about Alien vs Predator very often because at the end of the day the individual series has have far more stories and, and games and comics and books and films so we don't get to talk avp very often we are going back to the start of avp's theatrical life here and we are talking to none other than the first writer on the project mr peter briggs welcome to the show peter hello guys and it's great to be here finally we should have done this a long time ago Peter and I have been talking on and off for years, years and years and years. I know. How long has it been? Decades? <laughs> 10, 20 years? I, I, I've I th- got no idea. I think 2010 at least. Yeah, m- must be at least, yes. And Peter's helped me out, fact-checking me on, on various articles and, and questions whenever I just have a random thing. And Peter, do you remember? And uh, he'll, he'll always help me out. But no, it's taken us somehow this long to have him on the podcast. Crazy. So we're, so we're here now, and we're going to talk about Terminator for the next two hours, right? <laughs> yeah. Terminator 3 specifically, as well. <laughs> so, uh, no, we are obviously talking AVP. We are obviously talking Peter's famed and fabled script. Infamous, I think. Infamous. And hopefully, we're going to get his memory going enough that we can get some details on that second draft that nobody okay. has ever seen. Go on, Peter, yes. get, the, get the get the cogs working in the, in the memory. No, 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 no. It, it's all there. It's all sort of in the in the memory bank. I wish I had a draft of it that I could access, but we'll talk about that later, I guess. Actually, then, before we do start to talk your part in this grand alien and predator story, one of the things we love to hear about our guests is pretty much just the first this time they you encountered yes. the beasts so do you remember the first time you ever laid eyes on hr giger or stan winston's extraterrestrial terrors it starts off i think for me i mean we've got to remember this was the 1970s and there was no internet we were stuck with the magazines we had at the time and, you know i was a regular reader of at that point in 1979 starburst and starlog i knew a few other magazines as well there was future life and you know some other things which which kind of came up so you know going back for me the first time i heard about alien was starburst issue eight which was a space 1999 cover and had star wars 2 news and i was you know i was and am still an enormous Star Wars fan. And there was a thing on it. It said Alien New SF Shocker on, on the front cover. And that in itself didn't kind of grab me. It was the it was the Space 1999 Star Wars thing on, on the front. And I was reading the magazine anyway. And I remember turning a few pages and then turned, as I was reading it, turned the page. And there was a Ron Cobb picture of the Nostromo, or I guess the uh, Leviathan, as it, as it was then. It was the big shot that he kind of did of the back of the engines of it drawn on graph paper. And I looked at this picture... You know, of this amazing image, this incredible design, and was just like, what the hell is this? And then there were a few more pictures over the next couple of pages. I think that there was a shot in the Nostromo's bridge. And I think, God, it's been so long since I've seen this. I think there might have been a, a picture of Giger and Ron Cobb in there as well. But it was like basically two pages of, you know, this has been shooting at Shepparton. And, you know, those drawings, Cobb's drawings immediately grabbed me. And I wanted to know everything there was to know about this. And this would have been March or April of 1979. And so at the same time, I found the first issue I'd seen of Fantastic Films, if you remember that, that magazine. And it was, I guess that was issue... I'd missed one. I'd missed one alien one because it, it had terrible distribution up in the northwest of England, which is where I was at the time. And it was uh, issue 13, I think, which was the yellow cover with Kane being winched down with Dallas and, and Lambert with the space jockey in the background. And, you know, this this is the time when the film opened. And so I'd already been primed by this Starburst article. I think that, you know, the film opened obviously did a big Star Wars-ish kind of opening weekend on May 25th. And I guess, I remember one of the kids at school telling me, oh yeah, there's, there's some pictures in the sun. You know, I guess the sun did a spread with the space jockey in on one day. I think they actually did print the alien, but I didn't see that issue. I saw the space jockey one. And so from March, April to September, I was sort of obsessed with alien. I needed to know all about it. I went off on a school trip to York and got Alan Dean Foster's novelization. I got that first issue of Fantastic Films. And then I guess the, the next issue of Fantastic Films was the, was issue, was it 14? Issue 14. I guess that was the one with 14 and 15 
2015 were the two big Ridley Scott interviews with, uh, and they had all of Ridley's, Ridley Graham's, you know, all of his storyboards. And, you know, that that was an exhaustive interview and still one of the best interviews with Ridley I think I've ever seen. And then Book of Alien came out. I remember I was in an art bookshop in St. Helens and found Giga's Alien and got that. And so before I'd seen even a trailer, and I was a kid, I think I'd just turned 13 at the time and wouldn't have been able to get into Alien anyway because it was an 18. But I was primed, man. I mean, I wanted to see this film and nothing was going to stop me seeing this film. And all through the summer, I was just waiting and waiting. In September, 6th of September, it opened in Britain. And my Uncle Eric, who had taken me as a baby to see 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah, you know, I pleaded with my dad, who I'd gone to see Star Wars with. And my dad just didn't want to go. And my Uncle Eric was like, oh, I'll take you. So my Uncle Eric sneaked me in to the cinema. It was the Odeon in Liverpool where I'd seen Star Wars and sneaked me in. In fact, weirdly enough, I I remember about a year later, I got friendly with the projections at the cinema. So I actually do have the quad poster from the lobby of the Odeon uh, Liverpool. So, you know, I do actually have that showing that I saw of Alien where I, I had the poster for that, which was great. So I remember, you know, I already knew everything that was happening in the film before I saw the film. So there was no, you know, there was no real surprises for me. You know, it just was a great film. Then after the film, I guess a month or so later, the uh, Richard Annabeel photo novel came out and I had that because back in the day with VHS kind of in its infancy, I didn't get a video recorder until I guess 1980, 81, my dad got. So I didn't have access to watching a film over and over again. So for years, you know, reading that Annabeel photo novel was the, my way of kind of keeping the film alive for me until I got to see it again. So, you know, that was my initial exposure to, to A and, you know, reading effects, you know, all the magazine articles that, that came out. Yeah, uh, just an enormous alien fan from the outset. I was just looking for my copy of the photo novel then, because I I think that is brilliant. It's terrific. No, it's a really great photo novel. I mean, I had actually had a few more photo novels from the time. I had a whole bunch of Star Trek photo novels from, from the original Kirk Spock series and but they were they were kind of if you remember they sort of came out they were almost a little bit mad magazine because they had you know they had speech balloons and they did that with the invasion of the body snatchers photo novel they did that with the close encounters photo novel which is really disappointing because you know if the close encounters one and had the same production value as the alien one did that would have been awesome with those big frames kind of you know across the page like that I think IDW revisited them recently, you know, the Star Trek stuff, and, and even tried using caps and stuff to create original stories with them as well. They did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> I haven't seen that book in years. Oh, and it, it, I remember, wow, I guess around about 1980, 1981, I came across a copy of Ron Cobb's Color Vision by Comic Mart, which I uh, I gave to a friend to borrow, and we... We ended up ending our friendship and I never got it back. So it took me many years to get another copy of that again. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I was just primed down the years. And then I guess we had Aliens finally in 86. What about Predator then? What was the first time you uh, you ran into that one? Predator kind of came out of the blue. I mean, I, I you know, I was a regular cinema guy. I'd seen the trailers. I knew it was a Schwarzenegger movie. You, you know, the, the trailer doesn't really give very much away. So I went into that completely blind and, of course, loved it. I mean, it, it is what it is. It's it's the perfect little film, really. I think I saw that at the Odeon Marble Arch uh, in London. And to my mind, that's kind of still my favourite of the, the, the Predator sculpts. I mean, there's something about the Predator in that first film that kind of looks realistic. I don't know whether it was the kind of urethane or, or whatever they were using on the sculpt, but if you kind of contrast that with the Predator and Predator 2, which looks a little bit rubbery, and then the Alien versus Predator Predators, you know, they're kind of, they're, they're different things. But yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, that was, I guess, probably that that film, you know, I'm a big soundtrack collector and, you know, I like to, to write to things I, less now than I used to, but I've got thousands of film scores. I think that was, was it? No, I guess probably, I'm trying to think of my first exposure to Alan Silvestri, probably like Back to the Future, maybe. That was 85, so that was a couple of years earlier. But, you know, that's a, that was a terrific score. And, you know, I, I, I had a couple of bootlegs of that down the year and down the years, and then finally it got a legitimate release in its pretty much in its entirety. Was Nick Kroll, I think, might have been before that, or the Kroll Star was Trek Horner. 2. Yeah. Star Trek 2 was Horner. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let's get them mixed up. <laughs> Well, that's that's cool. I really like that story, actually. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love asking, uh, you know, even if it's, you know, non awesome. I say non awesome. (laughs) If it's just uh, normal folk like us, just hearing those original encounters is it comes up with some really fun and often, you know, unique 
situations as well. So that's that was really cool. So we do have another tradition as well on the podcast, and <laughs> this is just because it's become such a long running friendly argument that now I'm like, come on, let's get the experts' views on this. Okay. And that is the skull in H.R. Giger's original Alien design. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a simple question of do you prefer it with the skull visible or not? Now, I know that you've got a soft spot <laughs> for a certain alien statue do, whose yeah. name yeah, yeah, I'm going to butcher here. So it's um, <laughs> yeah. Takayuki Takeya's alien pile yeah. statue, and the skull is definitely visible in there. Technically speaking, I mean, you're referencing the alien pile, but before there was the alien pile, there was a, a single of that creature, of his version of that creature, which was just the, the creature sort of standing there. And it's the free, I mean, uh, you know, fans will be listening to this, so they'll know the one I mean. But it's the freakiest looking thing. It's sort of it's sort of standing there in a sort of hunched kind of thing with its with its arms sort of slightly back, but stretched forward. And it always sort of reminds me of, of sort of the raptors in Jurassic Park in sort of the way that it looks. But what I like about that is that its head is just unfathomably long. Um, I mean, recently, yeah. um, it was, um, was it Figure, Figure Arts, I think, brought out a Takaya. Takaya actually himself did a sculpt of that alien. You sort of look at it, he, he pulled his dimensions back. Whenever I've thought about doing an alien film since, my version of it would be probably an even more outlandish version of the alien than that looks, because I, you know, I, I think it's important to get away from the guy in a suit look on it. Which, I mean, you know, even if you look at Covenant, I mean, the, the alien in that is is relatively skinny, and you know, obviously isn't in long shots a guy in a suit because he's CG. But I, I think I would. I would hire Takaya, honestly. But there are some beautiful sculpts, some very surreal ones on the internet by by various fan artists that are quite beautiful. But but Takaya's one is the one. I mean, I I'm not a fan of the warrior. I don't like that head. I, I think it's a cop out. I, you know, I mean, the, the reason what was Cameron's reasons for it? Didn't he say? I think he said he actually they made a couple of vec form canopies for the the alien. They didn't. And then he yeah. looked at it and really because I've actually I've actually heard that they they did. But I'll bow to you, kind of delving into that. I asked Tom about it because I I was always curious because I'd never seen pictures you know mm -hmm. the quote was Cameron said that they'd break or they had been breaking so that was like the quote that. exactly yeah that it would it would be too fragile on set so I asked Tom about it I was like look did any ever get made can, can we see some because he was the one that sculpted the head and yeah um, yeah and he was like nope but do you remember that there was I've forgotten who shot that was it one of the Scotex I think there was the alien door poster which was the alien breaking through a wooden door yes yeah, I had. I was living in a. I had this crappy bed sit in um, in London when I first moved to London at the end of the eighties, and I had almost the same door. So I had that alien on, that, <laughs> on the back of the door, and it really did look like it was breaking through the door. I loved that poster. I hope. I think I've still got it somewhere. There was a darker variant, but I had. I had the the early one. I think that was crisper and brighter. They go for a pretty penny now. Yeah, mm. I, I I remember in Woolworths and seeing. I'm sure it must have been a variant because it was one where the the leg was cut off, but it was like the, the mm. warrior head. I remember seeing that in Woolworths and going, oh, I've got to get it. And when I had the money, I went up there and it was gone. Yeah. So it, it was one of those, thing, every so often you'll see someone posting, oh, look what I got. And I'll go, ah, oh, that thing I remember. I think I would have Stop got it from one of the London comic stores, either for Bin Planet or mm. Meltdown or someplace like that. Well, talking about James Cameron, now he... I mean, this is where I, I'm from that older generation as well, where it was like videotape and DVD didn't exist, etc. James Cameron, he famously wrote a rebuttal to critics of Aliens for Starlog magazine in, um, yeah. 19, I think, 92. <laughs> I yeah. Yeah, yeah. In it, he refers a number of times to a certain Peter Briggs. Now, was this you? Because if so... It's, it's me and I'm heads, guilty as charged, yeah. Yeah, yeah butting heads with Cameron, it feels like it was foreshadowing that development hell on AVP in a weird way. Yeah, when, when was that? I mean, that was... Uh, no, no, it was much earlier than that because... Uh, yeah, I thought I, so too. I, yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 in the... Uh, yeah, I think it's in the It might have got reprinted in 92, maybe. I don't maybe. know. Maybe. Yes, that would that would make sense. But uh, no, I think it was probably not long after the film because I think I, I wrote a... Yeah, I wrote a letter in and uh, I'd written an, another one. I think the 92 one, the second letter, I think that was me commenting about Terminator 2, I think, J just as I was writing Alien vs. Predator. But, you know, I, I mean, it, this was a long... This was 30 years ago. I was a brat. You know, I was a kid. March of 87, by the way. 
there you go and you know i mean it's it's probably akin to kind of you know every annoying kid on twitter now who kind of you know thinks they know everything and i was that annoying kid but yeah yeah and weirdly enough that letter did go on much longer it was edited down i can't remember what the original letter what was cut from it but yeah no i i, I took i did i took cameron to task for some things i mean it was like yeah where's the ringed ring world that lv426 is around and I just point out nice things as well in it. You what know, did you I, think I, of his answers? Did he answer you to your satisfaction in that rebuttal? Or did I don't you still understand. Think, oh. I don't understand why he felt the need to answer anyway. But you know, his answers were fine. I got a sort of weird. Oh right, okay, okay, okay. You're not safe from the director. But I don't think he's ever done anything since. Actually, has it like that? Nah, not the best of my knowledge. No. Nah. But you know, I guess that was you know after Terminator, that was his 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 big his big yeah. thing. But yeah, that was me. I was a, I was a kid. I was a brat, and um, and I was a big fan of Alien, and, and I was a little disappointed in Aliens. I'll, I'll be honest, because that first film is is almost perfect, and the uh, the tone is very different. I, what 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 I like about Alien over Aliens is I like that very realistic, very natural, very gritty tone that exists down to the acting, down to the dialogue, down to, the, you know, the almost kind of improvisational kind of way that Ridley, you know, had his actors sort of play it. And, you know, the, the sort of almost handheld cameras in, in some scenes. And, you know, Ridley as a, as a, as a filmmaker, God, I mean, you know, he, Cameron just couldn't really compare to that. Although it, it's a classic in its own right. But in, in terms of performance and direction, I feel that Ridley's, approach was superior to Cameron's. Can I ask you, from the perspective of a writer, just quickly touching on that, when the special edition eventually came out and we saw those scenes which I felt added a great deal to Ripley's characterization, like the stuff between Burke and Ripley and finding about her daughter and stuff, would you say that changed your perspective of that film or did you still feel mostly the same way about it? Well, I knew those scenes were there anyway because, you know, I'm a fan and I'd read the book and seen some stills of things that have been cut from it. So I do much prefer the special edition for those reasons the only there's right. only one line i i don't like which is which is hudson's kind of big mama bug yes like yeah. you know because it does give the the game away a little bit at the yes end. uh if, if you just excise that one exchange i think pretty much everything else that's put back into the special edition is a huge improvement to it then you, you know we're in into territory where it starts to become a film that's way over two hours and it's a very very Weirdly enough, I'm writing something at the moment and, and it's sort of that thing of how, how many pages in, how long into the story can you get away with before you have to show the creature? And when you look at the special edition of Aliens, I mean, OK, you have the, the, the stuff with the derelict put back in, you have the face hugger, but you don't really see a warrior alien un, until, you know, obviously the, the, the scene with where uh, it's, uh, is it Drake who gets it first? Uh, uh, the trick, I think. Dietrich, it's Dietrich, yeah. Dietrich, I beg your pardon. Female yeah, Dietrich, it comes out of the wall and it gets it, yeah. How long is that in, in the special edition? 40, 50 minutes. Long no, it's time. not. No, it's, it's about, I think you're hitting about 60, 70 minutes. It's a very, very long time into the film. And it's the same with Alien. Alien is a slow burner. I mean, it takes its time before we, we have the chestburster sequence. But no, I, I do. I like all of those extended scenes. Y you know, I do like the extended scenes in Alien as well. Although, you know, once we get to the cocoon sequence, you know, if you're kind of looking at it from a canonical point of view as an overview of the whole series, the cocoon sequence in one respect given that we, you know, we know about the, the Queen Alien. In one respect, it, it becomes a little difficult. But, you know, I had come up with my own my own life cycle for the alien when I was writing Alien vs. Predator. And there is that weird line that people don't pick up on in, you know, it's not a great film, obviously, but, you know, Alien Resurrection. There's the whole exchange with the scientists and Brad Dourif and everybody where they talk about the amount of different reproductive ways that the Queen Alien has. So, you know, I think that there is sort of some latitude to kind of to sort of suggest that the, there is more than one way to skin a cat. Well, it's, it's very flexible, I think, in terms of what you can do with it, especially with things like the DNA reflex and stuff like that, which I think must must be a huge benefit for writers as well in, in making things like that not seem too far uh, left field. You know, interestingly, I mean, we're into sort of, you know, if you sort of are going to factor in Prometheus and the black goo, it becomes even more, you know, off the wall. I mean, where, where do you stop? Strangely enough, the, the black goo, I've been working with Evil Powell, who was uh, the producer of Alien, executive producer of Alien, and has been a friend of mine for like 10 years. Uh, Evil was a producer on the thing I'd be working on with Gary Kurtz until, unfortunately, Gary's death a couple of years ago, called Panzer 88, which is World War II 
it was a supernatural film. Now the slant has changed, and it's it's now a World War Two science fiction film. But I've been working with Evor over this time, and Evor has just written a script with a guy, which has been made as a film. And it's been sitting on a shelf. Uh, the film's called BIOS. Zemeckis and Spielberg have just produced it. Tom Hanks is starring in it, and they're just waiting for COVID to be over. So I think actually they just sold it to Apple a few weeks ago. But I hope that people on the press junket of BIOS talk to Evor about the script he wrote, which was a direct sequel to Alien, right after Alien. Uh, And I've read it, and it's an interesting read because it deals with a primordial black goo. Interesting. The script is called Universal Matter, and Ivor told me that, you know, he'd given it to James Cameron before Cameron came on Aliens and deals with a, a mercenary team who go into a pyramid. And it's it's an interesting read. I think it's a, it's a missing factor link that uh, in yeah. the Alien story that people should talk about. Definitely. I met Ivor once, but I've never managed to, to talk to him because I know he'd, he'd also talked about at one point a, a prequel he'd done or a treatment for a prequel he'd done some event where there's just he didn't really give too much info on it and i'm just like i love this stuff i'd love to talk to you please he's very approachable and um no it wasn't a treatment it was a full script i've read it okay so avp alien versus predator is famously based on that comic but there's yes. a lot of comic in the series and a lot of really fantastic ones that people love so one of the things i'm curious about is is just how familiar you were with those other titles before you started working on avp when you say other titles, you mean... Alien and Predator comics. All of them. I'd read them. I read them all. So the, you were actively reading them before you decided to adapt? Uh, yes. Movie, yeah. Well, in that case, then, I'd love to know if there's a particular series that you would think would be fun to adapt into a film. Wow. I mean, there are holes in my knowledge of, over the course of years because, you know, Dark Horse has done an awful lot. Wow. I mean, I remember in the early days, I like the Colonial Marines bug hunt story. That was that was fun. You know, there's, there's great ideas all the way down through them all. But as a writer, when I'm adapting things like if you look at Hellboy, for example, which I adapted back in the early days of that, there, there really wasn't very much in the way of material. And so I didn't have an awful lot to pick and choose from. But, you know, our Hellboy film, you know, the, the story you see is by and large the, the story I sat down and wrote. If you compare that with Seed of Destruction, which was the original the original Hellboy comic, it's a different story altogether. You know, there, there's elements from it. But, you know, I, I think if I were approached to do it now, 30 years afterwards, you know, it would be a colossal task. But, you know, you have my feeling is if you're going to adapt something you have to pull from everything and i would probably sit down i don't think it would be a straight adaption i think i would pull ideas from everywhere and try and put it together so no i wouldn't say that there was necessarily any one storyline that i would want to adapt it would be a greatest hits collection well you've probably told this story countless times privately and in interviews but for (laughs) listeners who might not be as into the research as me and Aaron. Could you tell our audience how one Peter Briggs came to be involved in the Alien vs. Predator project? What was the genesis? How did that come about? Okay, well, you know, I had seen Star Wars and I had seen Alien and these two movies galvanized me into wanting to be in the film industry. And I come from a small town in the Northwest and I knew that I wasn't going to be in the film industry there. So I moved to London. I became a runner at a commercial house. You know, I cleaned loos, I um, wallpapered walls, I did everything. And in between that, I learned how to operate a camera and edit on a 1635mm steam bag. So I got my union card eventually as an assistant cameraman and the film industry in Britain collapsed because those nice guys from Canon Films came in, destroyed the British film industry. You know, we saw Elstree Studios. I used to live in Borehamwood, in fact, when I was writing Alien vs. Predator. And I would walk down and get my milk in the morning uh, uh, from the Tesco and, and um, you know, they were wrecking the studio to build a, a supermarket. So at that point, the film industry was in a bad state and I was kind of supporting myself by working at Stills Photography Place. And I'd been writing scripts for a few years with some friends and I had a small pile of scripts and, and a couple of my own. I had a script called Total Recoil, which I'd written in 1984, which was a Dirty Harry Goes to London sequel with a guy called Nick, Nick Templin. I had another one called Radio Calling, which was about a Chicago radio company company radio station that was a comedy i'd written that with a guy called mark mccrory i had an adaption of robert mason's book about helicopter pilots in uh, the vietnam war called chicken hawk i had a computer thriller i'd written called nighthawk uh, a bit no it wasn't called nighthawk big upon it was called nightfall 
which was a sort of before the internet existed thing about a future virus program that could take down all computer systems. And there was probably another one, but I'm blanking on it now. And so, you know, I was in a, a spot where I wasn't going to be going. I, you know, I, I didn't go to film school. I got my union card, was to all intents and purposes, a not very good film cameraman uh, that wasn't going to be hired for that. And one day I decided, well, you know, just on a lark, let me see if I can get some representation. And so I photocopied all the scripts, had a huge pile of scripts. There was no internet, obviously, for another 10 years or so and took it around all the various talent agencies in London and, you know, shoe leather knocking on people's doors cover a letter of all the scripts and you know got a few knockbacks from from some smaller agencies and then one day i came downstairs and there were two envelopes on the doorstep with some junk mail and one of them was from william morris and one was from my icm and i opened the icm one and it said can you give us a call we're interested in representing you and the other one was from william morris and said the same thing so I met with the guys. Um, I first of all went with a, an agent at ICM, spent a year working with them, and they put me together with Paramount UK. And at the time, Paramount UK were developing science fiction material. There had been a Writers Guild strike in the States, and they knew that if the WGA went on strike again, that they needed to have some way of replenishing scripts. And so they kind of very sneakily did this backdoor thing of opening Paramount UK and developing material. And so I was working for a lady there developing science fiction material for Paramount UK. And I was suggesting William Gibson stuff and everything was being rejected. I mean, nothing I came up with, you know, they wanted to do. And the crunch came when I suggested Starship Troopers and was considered by Paramount 1950s Heinlein crap. Then the next week, TriStar bought it for Paul Verhoeven. And I spent the best part of a year at this point working for Paramount. It was clear it was going nowhere. And so one Saturday afternoon, I went, I was in Camden Town, making the usual run of all the comic stores that I used to go. And I uh, walked in and there on the end cap was Dark Horse's Alien vs. Predator. This was at Mega City One. And I bought it and it just started to rain outside. The uh, World's End pub was right across from the tube station. So I, I ran across with my plastic bag of comic and ran in, bought a Guinness, sat down, read Dark Horse's Alien vs. Predator and thought, you know, that's pretty good. And then the issues started to come over the course of the next few months. And the more I sort of looked at this, the more I thought, you know, if I was going to write this as a writing sample, it would kind of be the thing that might get me in with Joel Silver, say, for, you know, Joel Silver was huge at the, at the time, get me in with Joel Silver for a rewrite. And so I had, you know, I came to the realization this was something I should do. And at the same time, I, a friend of mine, a Finnish film journalist called Yohani Nermi, he was very good friends with H.R. Giga. So I'd been pushing Yohani to get Giga onto Alien 3. And he, he you know, he was all, uh, in turn friends with Rennie Harlan, who had just hit with Nightmare on Elm Street. And so we engineered getting Giga onto Alien 3. And as a result of that, in, this was, I guess, the, the summer of 1991. I went down to Pinewood Studios and went onto the set of Alien 3 and as a guest of Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff. And that was a, an entertaining experience in itself. I got shown around the creature shop. I met a young sculptor there. Uh, I didn't know his name at the time, but it was a it was a guy um, called Chris Halls who changed his name to Chris Cunningham. And in a year, in fact, about six months later, I was working on Judge Dredd. I'd been hired to write the Judge Dredd movie and suggested Chris Halls based on his work in 2008. I hadn't made the connection at that point between the two guys. But, you know, I sat down with Alec and Tom and they told me some entertaining uh, horror stories about aliens three and it was pretty obvious even at that stage that the film was in trouble and tom and alec said so you know what what do you do and i said well i'm i'm trying to be a writer and they went oh how's that going and i said well you know not really anywhere you know i've got an agent but i'm you know well what are you writing at the moment and i sort of shamefacedly shuffled my feet and i said well uh, actually I'm, I'm writing alien versus predator there was like a brief moment where alec and tom sort of looked at me and then howled with laughter and they just went seriously and i went yeah i i I think it was Alec who went, oh man, oh, I can't, I can't see that happening, which is hilarious when you consider that they ended up doing the yeah. visual effects for Alien vs. Predator another 10 years on. You know, and I said, oh, have, have you guys seen Predator 2? Because Predator 2, I think, had just come out at that point. And obviously the trophy case sequence in that with the alien skull. And they said, no, no, we haven't seen it. We'd be too busy with this. And, you know, I talked about that. And off I went and I finished the script. 
And I moved from ICM to William Morris at this point. I called up Steve Kennis, uh, William Morris, who was the, the guy I met a year prior. And I said, uh, Steve, I know I didn't go with you before. I said, but if I came to William Morris, would you still be interested in representing me? And he was like, sure, Pete. You know, he was a big bluff American guy, very much like anyone's idea of what a, a Hollywood film producer looks like with, you know, big guy with a cigar and behind a big desk. And so I, you know, had moved to William Morris and all my friends just made jokes about me writing Alien vs. Predator at this time. They were like, Peter, why are you doing this nothing is ever going to happen with it and i was sort of bullishly forging ahead and and i took it into william morris and my agent said okay pete this was the first thing i'd ever given him that was new he said okay pete what do you got and i put the script on the desk upside down and he sort of looked at it quizzically and pulled it across the table turned it the right way around and he looked at it and went alien versus predator pete have you any idea how hard this is going to be to sell and i sort of shrugged you know and kind of like made noises and he went look you know i'm friends with larry gordon i gotta go across the state next week you know larry's an old friend of mine i'll take it with him you know we'll have a chat and so that was that and I, at the time you know i was make, actually making at the time i remember a model of the halcyon model of ripley's power loader i'd sprayed that in the garden with paint and i was putting it together and i remember the first good sign was my agent called me from lax and this is the day you know the days before there were cell phones so you know he called me from the payphone at lax uh, having landed and obviously availing himself of the in-flight drinks and he was like pete this is the greatest thing i've ever seen you know i, I, I can't <laughs> wait to talk to larry about this you know it's a great script you know well done and that was that in fact i don't even think i talked to him i think it was on the answering machine and so a couple of days later, I remember I was finishing off my power loader. It was within a hair's breadth of Ripley's hair being painted. And the phone went and it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I answered in the hallway. It was my agent, Steve. And he said, Peter, where are you? Uh, and I said, I'm, I'm in the hall. He goes, he goes, are you sitting down? I said, no. He goes, sit down. I, so I sat down dutifully on the stairs. And he said, I've sold your script. And I was like, what? And he said, 20th Century Fox, Joe Roth, came to Larry Gordon last week, wanted to, you know, know if they could develop it, the idea of Alien versus Predator. And literally, my agent walked into the right place at the right time, and I sold the script overnight, which is, you know, people tell you, you can't do this because you won't have, you don't have the rights, nobody will look at it, it will never happen. And it doesn't, something like this doesn't happen. And it did happen. It was a billion to one thing, and I was very lucky. And that was that. It always surprises me because it's always the, the story's so right place, right time. Everything falls into the, you know, the the, the correct order, and it's like this huge yeah. thing. It's, it's it's incredible. It is. It's like the universe kind of just just put all of the blocks into place at the right time. But then saying that, you know, shortly thereafter, Joe Roth left Fox, and Peter Chernin came in and killed the development slate. And unfortunately, we were on that development slate. You know, so it kind of, it didn't happen. There were, you know, there were some wrinkles uh, along the way. I mean, I remember the Roland Emmerich thing. Lloyd Levin, who was Larry Gordon's development guy at the time, you know, executive producer, called me up and said, do you know Roland Emmerich? And I said, no. And he goes, he's just done this movie, Universal Soldier. And I'd literally only just seen it at the cinema. I went, oh, and he goes, yeah, he's, he's kind of, do you think he'd be a good fit for this? And honestly, I didn't. <laughs> you know, this was, this was Roland Emmerich off the back of Universal Soldier before he'd done Stargate, before he'd done Independence Day and, you know, everything that, you know, we come to think of as a Roland Emmerich film. But, you know, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to jeopardise my chances back then. So I, I ummed and I said, well, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. So, you know, I mean, they were talking to Emmerich about it, but it didn't really go anywhere despite what Dean Devlin was saying at the time. And then the project was sort of killed. But, it, you know, there were people inside Fox that, who, development executives who were trying to keep the project alive and, and, you know, some other odd things along the way down the years. But it was a casualty. It was, you know, after being in the right place at the right, right time, I was in the right place at the wrong time. And if Joe Roth, I mean, I talked to Joe Roth about this year, years after because he produced his company, Revolution, produced Hellboy, um, which I wrote, uh, co-wrote. And, you know, we had a good reminisce about what could have happened, what, what could have been. Uh, I know Larry Gordon would have liked to have seen that film. I think we all would have liked to have seen that film. I, I think most of the fan base would have preferred to have seen your interpretation. That's very kind. Thank you. Even just as a first draft, you know, everybody always says, you know, first drafts are rushed, they're going to need the polish and all that stuff, all that mm. stuff. And, you know, you've got to do your polish. But even just from reading that first draft, I'm always like, 
Oh, it's well, it's interesting because, you know, you have to remember, first of all, that it's not really based on the, the comic book. Uh-huh. I mean, it is and it is. I mean, it, I, you know, I make no bones about the fact that, yes, I ripped the comic book off. I did. But it's not a straight adaption, partly because there, there were story elements in there that I didn't really feel fitted into the alien universe. And that there were things that I, I just wanted the story to go off in a different direction. And so, I, you know, I did what I usually do, which is I cherry pick things from places where they do work and then change things when they don't so it's it's a weird thing because it's not really an adaption but it's not a piece of wholly original material either and it was never meant to be a script that was meant to be made i mean it was a script that was just to serve a purpose of me trying to get a development job a rewrite or or something on some project that i could build a career on so the the fact that 30 years later people are still talking about it is is weird and nice but but a little odd so yeah that was that well speaking of the whole not being a direct adaption Mm -hmm. uh, angle of it i mean immediately one of the more noticeable changes that you you made is that ryushi was completely different you know it's not this desert prospecting world anymore but a jungle communication relay so what, what was it that made you think that didn't work in terms of the series sunlight <laughs> okay so that simple sunlight I mean, alien, alien is is a thing in the shadows that jumps out of the shadows, and there it is, dark and it's creepy. And if you have an alien walking across the desert, that's not scary, and you're just looking at it. Yeah, I mean, and and plus, which how many times have you ever seen like an episode of Star Trek where we're at Vasquez Rocks and everyone's running around? You know, it becomes a cowboy movie. And the Predator movies, Predator is is in the dark at night. It's in verdant canopies or cities. Alien is in in dark industrial pipe wasteland or, or a, a creepy alien world and Ryushi in the comic just didn't do it it was just too bright the possibility for suspense wasn't there you know you just see the aliens running around in broad daylight and it just wasn't exciting and so I, I changed it to this Florida-esque swamp type world with a kind of I was in my mind sort of thought what it would be like if you took the refinery from Outland and you chopped the pillars right down and then put them in the middle of a swamp and that was my locale. There was always this sort of sneaky suspicion of we're tipping it a bit more to the predator side here deliberately you know with the with the jungle-esque stuff. No, that, that wasn't even a consideration. It was just, what is spooky? I could see how you would think that, yeah, we know the Predator looks good in the jungle, but by the same token, the aliens look good in an industrial setting. So this was sort of both worlds, really. It was putting you know one into the other, but it wasn't really a consideration. It was just, I couldn't really use that world from the comic because it wasn't scary enough. I tell you what, I, I always thought it was inspired by, there was a piece of artwork during the AVP run, which was of the Predator in a swampy area, and it was holding an alien up like that, and another one was coming out of the water. Honest to God, I thought it was that, but what you say makes a lot more sense. Weirdly enough, I saw that. I think I saw that after. I can't remember when did that come because was that when, when I was when I was writing. It was yeah. during the run. I looked at that and I really liked it, I remember. But I think by that time I was so far into the story, I was just like, no, the hell with it. I'm not going to change it. I I just thought that would be a great fusion with this tropical life being converted into this giga landscape of death. I think it would have worked really well. It does. And and one of the considerations that I had during that, which was life forms. And it's like, okay, so what happens when you eventually get a life form that, you know, let's say you had the Alien 3 alien that could travel quite quickly, quite fast. I mean, does it move away from the hive quite quickly? I mean, what happens if it gets outside of a predator blast zone proximity? I needed to be able to sort of tie up the story so that the alien doesn't escape at the end. I could see that. But then you're into hive world stories and and the alien spreading across the planet and could have been a sequel. I don't know. Well, back in the um, 90s, when it was still in the process of, you know, turning into a prospective film, you mentioned you would have liked to have cast Joan Chen or Tia Joan Chen, yeah. Yeah, I'd seen... um... Sorry, who was the Wayne's World girl? I've forgotten. Yeah, Tia Carrera. Tia Carrera. Think, uh, Tia Carrera. Films, yeah. Yes. But, you know, Asian actresses weren't as big then as they are now. Aye. But, you know, Joan Chen certainly was. And, you know, she ended up in Judge Dredd, which I, I was writing just after that. And, yeah, she would have been excellent. If Disney got in contact, we, and for all we know they might have, but it, hypothetically, and you were given the keys to AVP the film completely redone in your image, and you were still using that character, who would you think of to cast as that particular character now? Oh, wow. 
I like off the wall casting choices, but that that mm. not, doesn't necessarily sort of go over. I mean, if you look at sort of some of the choices, you'd end up with pretty girls, really, honestly. Now, me at this point, I'd probably go completely opposite. I'd probably write it for Aquafina or somebody. Okay, interesting. <laughs> You know, because she, I think she's, I think, A, I think she's a terrific actress. I mean, did you, did you see Jumanji too? Yeah. She could hold her own. I mean, she's good. She's a great actress. And I don't know. I haven't really given it any thought. You know, I'd have to go down a casting list. One, one of the really interesting, well, I thought it was really interesting things that I noticed when <laughs> I love prep for interviews and articles because it just gives me an excuse to go back and reread things. Mm hmm. I'd completely forgotten about this. This wasn't even in my mind at all what, until I was rereading. And you did the back verse to first, you know, before Alien Covenant. I mean... It's so weird because I saw Alien Covenant and I went, oh, hey, was somebody reading my script? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, I did. I was surprised to see that. The setup was a little different, but, I mean, was was there any particular thing going off in your head while while you were writing that piece, that sequence? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, we, we'd seen chestbursters in Alien and Aliens at that point, and, you know, we, we've obviously got Ripley's one in Alien 3, which I hadn't, you know, you've got to remember, I was writing it before I'd even seen Alien 3. And it was like, how do I do this differently? And I think in one of the Dark Horse comics, there was a head burster, I think, chest burster coming out of somebody's head, like directly up vertically. And I didn't want to go there. And I just thought, what if you play it for tension? What if you play it for kind of weird effect? And, you know, this guy has his seizure and he hits the floor and he's he dies. You're like, oh, OK, he's dead. And then the body moves. And then, you know, I just I like the idea of the, the body being shoved off to reveal the creature so i yeah it was just me you know, my way of sort of trying to not do the same thing again I, I will, at least put a little variation in it i will say one of the things that's always stuck in my mind from your script and this is another example of seeing a film come to fruition and me thinking wait i've seen that somewhere before i really like this part in your script where you have Noguchi, she's using a holographic samurai warrior to train mm -hmm. with. Um, yeah. It brought to mind Total Recall with that holographic tennis player. And there's one point where an alien attacks her. She starts, she activates the hologram to distract it. I remember when I saw Jurassic World and that scene <laughs> where I think it was a velociraptor and this holographic other dinosaur come and I thought, somebody's what um, read your version of Alien versus Predator. It's weird. Uh, I, I do actually get occasionally... <laughs> I, get, I, I meet sort of A-list writers who are now far more successful than probably I'll ever be. And I say, oh, yeah, we were reading your scripts when they were big influences yeah. when I was a kid. So it, who knows? But, you it's know, inspired it people. Of, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it could just be a case of coincidence. I, I did notice when Steve Perry wrote his Alien Prey book that he pinched that for the book. So that was interesting. Talking of books and uh, other pieces of, of the series, then, I guess. I noticed a good few deeper cuts when it came to references in your script. You know, there was what mm -hmm. did to be Dan O'Bannon's data sticks from the original script. Yeah, well, they were. They were there. And that's directly back from, you know, me having Color Vision, the Ron Cobb book, yeah. and the Book of Alien, because I love those designs. So, yeah, those those data sticks, very much so. I, I really like them. So, yeah, they were they were definitely from that. What about some of like, the characters as well? There was a Bouvet in there and a Goldsmith. Yep. Was, was that all intentionally... Yes, yes. In fact, the, the action takes place on uh, Linson's range. And at the time, Art Linson was uh, a really big producer. He just produced The Untouchables. And so that was named after him. At the end, one of the, I think that Dropship comes from Fort Powell, which is a reference to Evil Powell. And yeah, there were, there were little things. You know, I, I was a punk back in those days. I mean, you know, I was a kid of the 80s and sort of, you know, all those Joe Dante movies had come out. And Joe Dante had kind of done all the fanboy references in there. You know, all characters were named after things. Robbie the Robot would turn up in Gremlins. And, you know, the, the, all these sort of things were, were in there. And it's the same sort of thing like Steve Norrington did with in movies like Death Machine. You know, we're young and we're stupid and we write that stuff stuff and i look back on it now and would i do it probably not but yeah they, they were very much conscious references would that be the kind of thing you'd have you'd have got rid of in the second draft or do you think that would have stayed some there? of that stuff did go in the second draft yeah 
some of that stuff did go. I mean, there were there were a lot of characters in in that first draft, which I did actually. You know, I, I listened to your review of the script, and you know, even your negative comments. You know, I took them on board, and, and I think that they're all they're fair points and, and are all accurate. And there are there was too many characters in that first draft. There were it was trimmed down slightly in that second draft. A few things did go, and it, it was a very different beginning. Yeah, that that's I know that's something Eric in particular is quite interested in. Yes. I would fucking love to see that visualised. There's a particular artist that I'm really fond of on on Twitter who I is mm-hmm. he's become my default artist for when I need him to visualise stuff that's never been visualised. And I was like, do do me a piece. Here's here's all I know. Do me a piece. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I I I would fucking love to see some zero G combat with the aliens and predators. Yeah, let me just briefly say because you know in in the first draft it sort of opens with uh, a sort of crevasse and you know, the camera goes into the crevasse and and there's um there's a cave and predators go into this this cave and there's an alien nest in there and that was the beginning. You read that first draft of Alien versus Predator. Second draft began in space. It began on a cartography ship, I think it was, and you know there's a character reading Moby Dick Son, he's sitting in his quarters and you know we're in, we're, we pull back from stars and we're in his cabin and there's a ping and it's like well we, oh, we've something's just come up on the, the scanner so it's, it was a little bit aliens at the beginning and y- you sort of you see this ship comes across a predator pod and one side of the predator pod is all sort of scarred and, and hacked and they they bring it into their bay and we have a time cut and then we see the outside of this this ship and it's just sort of floating there and there's some debris coming from it and suddenly these three little dots of light go across the hull and go across to the airlock and we're inside the ship and the airlock opens so we're inside the airlock and the airlock opens and, and we're in zero G and there's debris flying through the corridors and everything is kind of generally wrecked and there's sparking light and these three forms come on board and decloak and it's predators in zero g suit which is not something we've seen have we ever even seen that in the comic books i don't not sure they i think they're in one of the more recent novels but i don't think there's ever actually been any sort of visualization of that kind of stuff yeah i mean if i was to visualize it i guess it would look with the predators with a plated kind of armor it would almost look like another kind of version of the nostromo spacesuits maybe but that's um, exactly what i visualized when i heard about that actually yeah i mean i guess there's not much you can do with plates and, and so they, they kind of work their way through the ship you know a body's floats through with sort of gut an internal uh, in, intel guts in CG in zero G and uh, and probably CG these days and then the aliens attack and you know it, it becomes this pitch combat and somebody very stupidly kills an alien and I I think I probably was consciously lifting this from the zero G fight with the Klingons in Star Trek Six Undiscovered oh, Country oh, with oh. the zero G blood and I just thought you know what happens if you've got zero G alien blood and well mm. it goes everywhere and it goes through the hole and so you know immediate explosive decompression everything gets ripped out the predators just suit back up get back out and they destroy the ship and then we're on board the ship and we're pretty much at that point on to the rest of the story as it as it sort of exists in the first draft but yeah that was a very different and i thought much better beginning than the first draft but the problem was i wrote those those two first drafts i wrote on there was a machine called an amstrad cpm which was a horrible clunky thing that it, it took like 45 minutes to do a save you were never guaranteed that it was going to save. And I would lose a day's worth of material and sometimes have to reconstitute pages from memory. And so I, I took to printing out pages of the script before I did save, just in case, so I could just you know copy type them back in. And I had sold the script, but hadn't bought a Mac at that point. My first Mac was a PowerBook 145, which I got in either 92 or 93. And so I'd written, you know, I'd started on that second draft on the CPM and they had proprietary discs that only that machine could play. And it's weird because I I read things now about people on television shows from like the last 15 or 20 years and they've recorded on formats that they can now no longer play. So, you know, you you have video formats that people have to do archaeology and find the machines in order to be able to play this. Well, this is the case with these drafts they are written on, on that CPM. And I know I've got the discs, I just don't know where they are. The copy of the first draft, I know, you know, when the internet first started off in like 96, 97, when we had web browsers, I know that somebody diligently sat down and copied the script word for word and put that out on the internet. I know there are some photocopies. I've seen a, a photocopy. 
But, you know, that, that first draft of the script that everyone read on the internet was somebody doing a transcription and putting it up there. But the interesting thing was the script that they transcribed it from was missing three pages towards the end. So a lot of people, are, you know, the, I don't even know. I haven't even checked, to be, to be honest. I don't know if the version that's online in most places like the Internet Movie Script Database is missing those three pages at the end. But nobody's ever commented on it. So I, I can only assume that those pages were not particularly germane to the story. So, yeah, that was interesting. We have a scanned copy on the website that's missing a couple of pages. No, missing one page. There we go. Somewhere near the auto shop, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I have not seen a copy of Draft 2 in over 20 years. I know the disc is somewhere, but even if I have the disc, I don't know that I can, I don't have a machine to access it. And I don't know that I've got a hard copy. So I don't know where it is. We, we certainly didn't, when we did the arbitration on Alien vs. Predator in 2000, 2004, they asked for it. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have it. I can't give it to you. They couldn't find it. Fox couldn't find it. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just lost. No, we'll, we'll find you an Amstrad, Peter. <laughs> we'll find I've it. I've got to find the disc. I have to find the yeah. disc. You spoke earlier about the the early days before AVP when you were at the um, UK arm of Paramount Pictures. You were trying to get them interested because this was back in the days, you know, Doctor Who was no more. There was a lot of resistance against this kind. You were giving them like Gibson, Cyberpunk, Starship yeah. Troopers. I think shortly after that, Verhoeven and TriStar actually got yeah. a hold of it and did it. They remained disinterested, as you say. Gibson, ironically, later became involved in Alien 3 as it happened. He this did. Is... I remember I, I met him actually because I went to the World Science Fiction Convention in Brighton in 1986 or 7 I think it was and he was giving a lecture and he talked about the, the process of, of writing Alien 3 to the lecture and um, it, it was very amusing. We talk now. It's it's funny. We Thanks to Twitter where he and I talk at times. You know, his script has, has been resurrected. You know, it's been done as a yes. comic book and, yeah. and as an audio book. He's an interesting one as well in that his first draft was the one that was most well known. Yeah, I guess it was. And then uh, the second one, uh, you know what, when I got hold of that, I was just, I was so satisfied. Because I just really like his second one. I hate his first one, but I love his second one. Mm -hmm. and, and all the adaptations that have come from it. I mean, it still needs a bit more polish, but I'm so thankful that we've got that kind of thing now. And I'd love to see more of it. I'd, I'd even love to see Eric Red's. I know it's bonkers. <laughs> He's the crazy one. Oh, I've had Red. I've, I've had Eric Red. In fact, I think I've got it. But I mean, like an adaptation of Eric Red. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, just just give give me everything. Come on, let's dig it all out. Especially since that seems to be something that is is in vogue at the minute. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was actually approached about doing an adaption of, of Alien vs Predator script. Okay. Is is that what you've been alluding to on Twitter then? Can't really talk about it. I think, I think right now, I think everybody, and I'm sure everyone who's listening to this podcast knows, the ongoing Thomas Brothers lawsuit is uh, is casting a long shadow over everything right now. All right, fair enough. So uh, we'll not ask you about the Twitter post then. <laughs> well, just going back to that period when you were at Paramount, this must have given you quite the insight into how studio executive minds work, which is completely different to how the ordinary man and woman on the street assume it to work. Would you say, A, that assisted you when it came to AVP's notoriously development hell-like cycle? And B, would you say that outlook might have changed since then, or if it's remained much the same? Oh, no, it's much worse now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it's much worse now. Yeah, I mean, that was, I, I honestly think that they were the golden days when people knew what they were doing. I wasn't really privy much to the development hell of Alien versus Predator. And because there wasn't one, the project was axed at Fox when Sherman came in. I was told by an agent at William Morris that there were moves to try and retool the project for Schwarzenegger. And nobody approached me about it, but, uh, you know, that was apparently the what they wanted to do. But I think that they just sort of, you know, they could have just called me up and talked about it. But, you know, people never think to do this. But, yeah, Arnold was, was sort of interested in, in doing it. Whenabouts was that? I couldn't tell you. I only found out about this around about 2006, so many, many years later. I've, I've only ever seen it said in one place, and I've never really found where any of this came from. But there was somebody who said that mid-90s, Emmerich was mm -hmm. adapting or look, looking to adapt the Capcom game, which had an Arnie character in it i was always kind of like when i when i heard you say that i was like "Ooh, i wonder if that was 
that. Well, if that or... were the case, that would certainly explain the the piece of Dave Dorman artwork that nobody can kind of figure out where it comes from. But like, you know, I can tell you categorically that the only people who did work on Alien vs. Predator were me. The Thomas brothers, they did a treatment for John Davis, probably right before Paul Anderson was involved in it, but it was nothing more than a treatment. In fact, I, I think that some elements of it might have ended up in the script, but, you know, they didn't end up with the credits on it. Did you actually get to read it through everything as part of the arbitration then? We had everything, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the early Alien vs. Predator draft. There's one draft that opens, which was, I, I think it was Paul Anson's. You know, because even though Paul Anson has the credit on it, you know, Shane Salerno was very much involved in those drafts, although he wasn't credited. But I think there was a Paul Anson draft I read that starts off in the Brazilian jungle with a, with a headhunter who's killed by a predator. Something along those lines made it into the novelization. Oh, it did. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't read the novelization. Oh, that was a nightmare for the guy who wrote that, actually. But yeah, the scripts never never surfaced. There's there's one earlier draft, but it wasn't majorly different. I, I have several of them in storage somewhere, but we had all the material at the arbitration. Yeah, so the Thomas Brothers. I mean, you know, the first inkling I got that something was up was, you know, it had gone through various people kind of expressing that they'd like to do the script. And then I was in London. I was living in London. This was this would have been about 2001, I suppose, 2000, 2001. And my agent, Steve, who the guy who sold the original script. Actually, no, was it Steve or was it somebody else? I think it might have been somebody else. Asked me if I'd like to go in to have a meeting with Jeremy Vault, Paul Anson's producing partner. And so I went in to, to meet with him and, you know, I, I, I thought it was a meet and greet. I thought they were just there to talk about a project. And then the story changed to what's going on with Alien versus Predator. And I very naively, I did I had no idea that this was even in the office. So I just said, oh, it's dead. You know, I mean, nothing's happening with it. I mean, it, nothing is happening with it. Shortly after that, I guess um, they made the play. So Paul, I guess, saw, a, saw an opening and went for it. And, you know, good luck to him. He did his version. When it comes to crossover event like this, because it's not just Alien versus Predator, you were also involved at an earlier stage with one of the, there have been several incarnations of Freddy versus Jason, which I think you were brought into because one of the guys at New Line had seen Alien vs. Predator. This is Mike DeLuca. Mike was a fan yes. of Alien vs. Predator, and, and they'd had a script draft from Ron Moore, the Battlestar Galactica guy, and Brennan Braga, I think, and they didn't like it. There'd been a long, long chain of writers coming and going on that project, so I replaced those guys, and then when I turned in my one, I was replaced in turn by David J. Scow, a horror writer. And then, you know, a few years later, but the version got made that got made. So, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I've, I've had quite a bit of experience of dealing with crossovers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from what I've heard, your Freddy versus Jason thing, it was a lot darker than what we got. And it had. Uh, what you I've... know, it's weird. People keep saying that. And I'm like, really? Because I kind of thought it was kind of cuddly and fun. Oh, um, OK. But, but... But but no, I mean I, I get that a lot. So I, I guess maybe it's just me being bitter and twisted, and it and it, yeah. it actually is. Uh, it actually is dark. Um, I don't consciously. In fact, now I, I'd probably go on if I was doing a Marvel or DC film, I would make a, a conscious effort to not make gritty because I'm rather fed up with gritty. Yeah, because um, I mean, what I was going to say was um, what I've heard was your take on that was to make like. Jason was a force of nature. Freddy was more pure evil. And when it comes to these sort of things, you're you're when it comes to Aliens versus Predator, Freddy versus Jason, you have to balance two sets of fandoms. When you're given an uh, a project like this, and it's a crossover type thing, is there something at the back of your mind where you have to stay very conscious of, well, I can't give this side too much heroism. I have to constantly balance it out. Is it purely about the needs of the stories? How do you go about balancing, I've got to appeal to fandom as well as just casual cinema guys? Yeah, I think everything you say is true. I think it is all of those elements. It helps if I'm a fan. I mean, when I, when I was approached on yeah. Freddy versus Jason, Mike DeLuca said, would you do this? And I said, no, because, uh, you know, I'd like the, I liked um, the Freddy movies. I hate, you know, and people know this, so I'm, I'm not uh, horrifying anyone here, but I hate the, the Friday the 13th films. I, I think they've got really very little intrinsic value. But by the same token, you know, it's my job as a writer to be 
as loyal and accurate to the franchises as I can be. People love these movies, and I think you have a responsibility that, you know, you don't arbitrarily change things just for the hell of it. You know, I was working on a, a Hellboy spin-off project for Universal called Silverlands, uh, which uh, we were told to stop doing because it transpired that Dark Horse was selling the rights from Universal to Millennium, and then we got the 2019 reboot, which, you know, has its pluses and minuses. But, you know, I always feel that you ought to be respectful to your franchises. And, you know, my two favorite films of all time, you know, my two favorite film franchises are the Alien movies and Star Wars. And so Rick McCallum, back in 2005, 2006, interviewed me to work on a, the Star Wars TV show for George Lucas that never happened, sadly. You know, and that would have been a dream job. But, yeah. You, you do. You know, I went back into those, uh, you know, I know we're veering completely off franchise here, but I went back into all of the TV Freddy installments that, that were made and kind of putting elements in there. You know, I've seen people say that. I mean, there's actually some books written about the making of Freddy versus Jason. And I think without blowing my own trumpet, I think that a lot of people like that draft. Again, you know, it was written at that time, not long after Alien vs. Predator, and I was a bit of a punk. And so I was writing those fanboy moments in there. People always sort of mention, oh, yeah, you had a scene where there's a skull of Creature from the Black Lagoon and there's the falls from Phantasm. And I kind of, you know, 30 years later, I sort of cringe and think, yeah, God, I did put those in there. Definitely wouldn't do that now. But, oh, man, I, you know, I'd love to come back and revisit either Alien or Predator or both again. The draft of Alien vs. Predator I've had in my head for 30 years now, thinking about where I'd take it, is, man, you know, I just hope that they do something good with it if the right situation with the Thomas brothers is all resolved and Fox go the way forward, that I'm sure that they will. Yeah, I think everybody still, they want that right EVP. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we haven't had... There is, you know, there's an awful lot I like about Paul Anderson's version. There's an awful lot I like about Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Or at least I should, I think there would be if, if I could see what the picture was. <laughs> Boy, the colour grade on that, they really needed to brighten that up. But I would like to, you know, I'd like to see something else. It wouldn't, you know, if I was doing Alien vs. Predator, it might be my version. It might be a completely different version. I would sit down and, as I said, I would go through 30 years of, of material and kind of try and work out where to go with it. It's, a, it's an odd one. There was a very peculiar situation that happened to me on Alien vs. Predator. The producer of it, Wick Godfrey, going back to Freddy vs. Jason again, right before the film came out, we were going through the arbitration and I helped get Ron Shusett and Dan O'Bannon the uh, credit on Alien vs. Predator. But before it came out, I, I knew Wick Godfrey because Wick was uh, Mike DeLuca's assistant on Freddy vs. Jason. And Wick asked me out to uh, a lunch in Beverly Hills. And he said, uh, OK, so, you know, here's the million pound white elephant in the room, Alien versus Predator. And I groaned and I'd read the script, obviously, at that point. And he said, so what do you think? And I, and I said, well, you know, it is what it is. And I've got some issues with it. And he, he was like, oh, what are they? And I started sitting down and telling him. And, you know, like one of the things I had an issue with was it's set in Antarctica. And at that point in the script, there was Lex finds you know if you remember in the film you have the the pepsi the coca-cola lid uh, necklace which the guy's wearing which is his reminder of you know his failed archaeological thing from years before you know not assuming anything well in the original script that was a crackerjack compass that he had on a on a necklace around his neck and when the predator temple starts shifting he goes wait a minute and he pulls out the compass and starts navigating his way through the, the thing with it and I said, wait, do you know what would happen in Antarctica to that compass? He said, what? I said, it would spin. I said, you're at the pole. You know, you couldn't use it to navigate through the... And he went, oh, interesting. He goes, what, what, so what else? And I told him some of the other things. And I was flying over to Barendorf Studios in Prague because I was possibly going to be working on another movie back then and met up with a friend of mine. And he said, hey, you know, uh, this is about a week later. You know, they're doing reshoots here. I said, for what? He goes, Alien versus Predator. I said, really? I said, what are they shooting? And he goes, well, hold on, I'll, I'll pull out the paperwork. And he pulled out the paperwork. It was pretty much the list of stuff I just told, told to Rick Godfrey the week before, including, you know, changing the Cracker Jack compass to a digital compass in the uh, in the finished film. So, you know, sometimes I kind of think, oh, man, I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. Um, <laughs> that, that would have been interesting to you know, see the critics comment on that. Yeah, that was a that was a fun experience. And weirdly enough, if you remember at the time, just before Alien vs. Predator came out, Predator had been re-released on a DVD with a different remaster. And there was a voucher in the Predator box to go and see Alien vs. Predator for free 
you know, you could take it to your participating cinema. So I thought I just bought Predator on DVD and, and I had that voucher sitting there. And after we just got through the arbitration, the arbitration was literally about a week before the film came out, before we had locked the credits into place, which was frightening. I mean, the senior legal guys from Fox were not happy campers at all. So I went and I saw the, the film with the voucher from the Predator box set. So I didn't pay to see the film. I used a voucher. I got one as well from this commemorative edition DVD. There we go. There we go. That's brilliant. But you you were mentioning earlier about, you know, all your fanboy moments and stuff as well while you were writing. Sure. There was one thing you didn't fanboy when it came to your first draft. Because it was, Mm -hmm. leading up to Anderson's thing, it was a huge question, you know, especially because Dorman's artwork of the Predalien Mm -hmm. was was still so infamous at the time. And and everybody was like, oh, we're going to see it. And then there's mention of like hybrids in the set reports and stuff. But you didn't, you didn't go Predalien. And in the past, I thought perhaps, you know, it was because maybe the DNA reflex wasn't a thing. But it came after Alien 3, so it was a thing. I did have a Predalien in the second draft. But it was coming out of a cocoon. It was a nascent alien. Okay, so not not like a big part of it. Yeah, it was it was just kind of coming out. It was from a, a predator that had been captured, and it was like just dealt with. It was just like you know broken broken tusk just womp, just kills it. So I didn't want it to be a thing, which it was in in Requiem. Were you just not into the the concept of it, or? Well, I mean, sometimes you kind of like look at these things and you think, would it be goofy? I mean, you know, I was offered the, the Green Lantern by Warner Brothers and I turned it down, not because I didn't like I love the comic books, but you kind of think, well, you know, it, this is a character who creates a giant glowing fist or drops a tractor on somebody that's created out of green mist, you know. And when you look at, when you try and visualize what that would look like, it will look like, you know, something from the mask. And it's, that's, that's okay if it's funny. But if you're trying to put that into a realistic context, it could look goofy. And, and I kind of, as somebody who loves these movies, you know, the Predalien could have gone two different ways. It could have been great. It could have been awful. It was something that has, you know, as a, as a writer, has your name attached to it. And you have to think, if people hate this, do you want to have your name attached to a project that people hate stuff in? And so I just, I, I decided to, in that second draft, as, as I said, I thought it was in the first draft, but it's been a very long time since I read it. You had a chest burst of predator but the predalien itself never ah, showed right okay but you did have you did have all these again which was why i was kind of thrown because you did you made specific mention of like other forms of aliens because the lemurs and the uh, rhinos and stuff like that 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 was definitely in the first draft which would have been so fucking cool to say but would it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not if we're going down the kennel line. Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I'm going to beat Ian home because I admire its <laughs> purity. You know, I, I like the way the alien looks. And, and we've had different looks of the alien throughout it, the various films. I mean, if you look at the Alien 3, the alien of that movie is basically pumpkin head, but with, uh, with an alien <laughs> head. And then, you know, you, you have the resurrection ones, which have that sort of gnarly organic look that Woodruff and, and Gillis do. But, you know, it, you know, I sort of like what Ridley did with the covenant alien even though we saw it in bright daylight and and i wish we hadn't but uh, you know we're going back to again my ultimate alien is is the takaya one but yeah i i I think once you start messing around with giga too much you've either got to know what you're doing or it just doesn't look like the alien anymore i mean for for me personally speaking you know the dna reflex is just such a integral part of, of, of the alien itself you know Ridley said as far back as the first one, if it had come out of the car, it would look different. So that, sure. that, that yeah. would be his head. Absolutely. And, and there's yeah. an appeal to me of seeing the different types together on screen. There is. But, I mean, by the same token, you know, it, it, you, if you go the route where you end up with the Kenner toy of the rhino alien and it doesn't look like that, you know. I mean, the, the thing about the alien is it's it's morbidly beautiful. I mean, it's mm. Giga's baby. And you, you get the fanboys who are kind of like, oh, man, wouldn't it be great if we had the rhino? It comes out of a rhino and it looks like a rhino alien. And then you get the Kenner toy. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to see that on film. I, I, I like the alien. I, I When Ridley says, you know, he, he says, oh, the big chap is all washed up and there's nowhere to go with him. I wonder if anyone has ever put the Takaya alien in front of Ridley and said, look, how about this? Because I can't believe that Ridley would never respond to that. To this day, I still don't know. Has Ridley ever uh, admitted that he's seen Alien versus Predator? Because no, I, I he mean, said he hadn't. Yeah, he exactly. was going by the comments because of Because if he had, you know, he would have realised that when he made Prometheus, he'd yeah. used an awful lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, Damon Lindelof said things to him like, you know they did this in AVP, right? Uh, Wayland, yeah. Apparently, Ridley turned and looked like uh, Lindelof had just spat in his face or something. 
I'm amazed that Ridley's memory doesn't go back to Ivor Powell's Universal Matter draft because there's some of that in Prometheus. Going back to your, you know, cherry picking details from the source material and what you thought would work and what wouldn't. Because mm-hmm. I, I, th- I believe you criticised this part being in Anderson's, but it's the whole blooding element of the comic. You oh were, yeah, you were rid of it. What is it about that particular thing that you don't like? Nothing. I like it. I like it a lot. I just you've seen alien blood go through two decks of the Nostromo. I haven't seen anything like it except molecular acid, maybe. And then you know you're asking for somebody to pick up an, a, an alien limb and bring it directly with that blood to your forehead. No, thank you. <laughs> it's like, oh, hey, so- sorry, Mexico, Hiroko. Uh, I just accidentally burnt right through your hair, but sorry about that. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> that was really, uh, you know, it, it works great in the comic books. But honestly, when I kind of sat and thought about it, I just didn't, I didn't want to go there. I mean, you know, you could see it uh, working like, you know, with some of the terrific like Hot Toys figures and things where you have that etched into the helmet. You know, I mean, that makes perfect sense. But, you know, uh, directly to an organic. Why do I feel like there was somewhere that had I can't remember if this was in the proper thing now, but like predators spit on it to dilute it or something. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure that was the thing somewhere. You said in interviews that you originally wrote the script with an eye towards it being, quote, economically viable. Yeah. Now, this is something people often forget. It can be very critical in a pitch meeting. Sometimes, like with the original Alien and Jaws, resources can force a sort of less is more approach into the hands of a filmmaker. In Alien, you had Kane's chest bursting scene. That's what grabbed the media attention. But I've always maintained it's, it's Lambert's death, which is the more haunting one that stays with people. And that's relatively cheap because most of it was completely off screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, with this in mind, Would you say, especially more in the second draft when you knew you had it as an actual project, did budgetary considerations cause you to scale back more than just set design for later drafts or give you ideas for increasing tension, intimacy and horror by eliminating that? The second second draft really was it was not major in any any major way. It was um, it was it was really about characters and trimming some dialogue here and there, molding several characters into one that opening. But no, all the other action sequences were pretty much they were all as is i don't think anything really drastically changed in that second draft the pred alien thing you know which was like three seconds i mean it was jump it's dead that's it i I, when i was writing that you must remember this was 1991 and at that time terminator 2 had not come out yet it was just about to come out and you know the world hadn't seen t1000 morphic effects you know which were all thanks to john knoll and and his brother creating photoshop and then you know two years later we began Jurassic Park and we've got CG creatures. But well, wasn't I, The I, Abyss I, I, was before Terminator 2? Yeah, wasn't? it was. I mean, that was, that yeah. was, that was what, the, that was what Photoshop was created for. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the glass water, well, the, the water tentacle, yeah. And it wasn't a consideration for me writing it because I was writing it as a sample. I wasn't writing it with any view for it to being over. I mean, I was writing it for a view of, you know, can you make this thing? But we didn't have CG effects then. I mean, it was still the, the tail end of practical effects. And when I was writing it, I was concerned that just on a sort of academic hypothetical level, not really thinking of it in terms of production, that the effects were doable. I mean, you know, we had the rhinos easily done now with CG, you know, hordes of aliens easily done now with CG. We couldn't have done that, those effects back then. So honestly, it was probably probably a good idea that the film didn't happen then. You know, one of the really great shots in Paul Anderson's shot is the swarm up the pyramid. That would have been along the level of the kind of visuals I wanted. But those visuals just would not have been achievable, I don't think. Yeah, you, you've always been quite complimentary of the CG stuff from the, the finished film. Yeah, no, I think it looks great. What was interesting, you know, we all know Charles Lazarica, who, you know, who's with a treasure miner. An absolute god. He's great. And, you know, he and I have had drinks a couple of times and he's a really nice bloke. And, you know, him putting together back the Rex Pickett draft for the Alien 3 release and fixing those effects, that was a huge service to Alien 3, which is so much better in the, in that release than it was in the, the slightly sloppy theatrical. But that was the last hurrah of kind of practical effects with the Rob. That Rob it, what really annoys me with the Rob puppet in Alien 3 is you see some behind-the-scenes shots where you see some of the guys puppeting it. Some of the shots of the rig and then puppeting it look better than the shots in the film. Mm-hmm. 
which does show that I think with enough with, with enough diligence that those shots could have really worked really well. But you know they were under the under the gun. Do you guys remember Premier Magazine at the time? The American uh, U.S. Premier Magazine had a big four or five page article on Alien Three and the problems that they were encountering shooting in England because you know people forget that the Gulf War was happening back yes. then. And and one of the things was that uh, American executives were too afraid to fly from Los Angeles to London in case right. um, the, the planes were targeted. Which, you know, sounds crazy in retrospect. You know, the Gulf is, is the other direction. But this was one of the things that was a, was a consideration that the Premier article talked about. And I've never seen anyone really reference that. And I don't know how you would get a hold of a copy of that now. Hopefully eBay, because that's where I'm going soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's, here's a really funny thing. I was flying over to Los Angeles to go to Portland, Oregon from there to meet with Mike Mignola back in 1990. 96, I would say it would be. And I just picked up a copy of Premier, that same magazine, from the newsstand at Heathrow Airport. And as I was flying over to the States, there was the very first, I think it was the very first picture from Alien Resurrection, which was a shot of Ripley and of uh, Ron Perlman. And it, there was a shot of, of them all bathed in red light. And I looked at this and I looked at Ron Perlman and I, I went, you know, he'd be kind of good for Hellboy. And so when I met Mike Mignola a, a few days later up in Portland, I pulled this, this premiere article out and I showed him this shot from Alien Resurrection. And Mike looked at it and I said, what do you think? Ron Perlman for Hellboy? Because, you know, we had no idea of what cast he was going to be at this point. And I was on the film for a couple of years before Del Toro came on board. And Mike looked at it and went, what, the guy from Beauty and the Beast? Are you kidding me? <laughs> And I just thought it was hilarious that we ended up with Ron on, on the film playing Hellboy and, you know, he was born to play him. Speaking of creature performers and suits and stuff, would you not want to see, again, it, it, in a hypothetical world, if, if yours was to become a thing, would you not want to see men in a suit performance? Totally. But it's, it's the difference between, I mean, if you look at Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park is a great example. If you look at that first Jurassic Park and you look at the Stan Winston raptor suits and you look at the CG in the film, a lot of that CG in Jurassic Park still stands up really well. But it, they, they switch the performance. So you have, sometimes you've got the rubber suits, sometimes Sometimes you got the CG. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I mean, as far as the Predators go, why would you do Predators any other way other than guys in suits? You know, as long as you nail that suit, it, you know it's going to look great. It would be great to have some elements of that. But, you know, it would depend on what form the alien would take. For my Takaya, my favorite Takaya alien, you know, it would be a variety of different looks for the aliens. You know, I mean, I remember if you've read the scriptment that Cameron wrote for Aliens, which is very different. I mean, the end of it is basically the end of Alien Resurrection. You have Ripley walk up to the nest and she takes the syringe and she stabs herself and gets carried in and ends up in the nest. And she comes to, if I remember correctly, aren't there a bunch of aliens they are carrying us. eggs into the shuttle? And, and like the, the ticking clock there was that it was going to be, you know, Ripley's got to stop the eggs from taking off on the shuttle, which, you know, Jim, I guess, very wisely changed when he wrote the script. But, you know, I always remember from that script and the way it ended up in Alan Deed Foster's novelization, the mention of the albino alien drones, which, you know, we've never seen in any real way. And again, it, going back to all this, you know, many years have passed, many films have passed since I wrote that original script. And we've seen a lot of different alien stuff. And it would be my job now to try and create the kind of unified field theory of alien and try and bring all that together in a way that makes sense of some of the things in the franchise that don't make sense, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and, and making things happen. I've had a, I was actually contemplating writing an alien movie, just a one-off alien movie on spec, because I came up with an idea that would have really explained away the engineers as being a different race from the space jockeys. It's what people want. <laughs> Yeah. That's, well, yeah, and it's what as a fan, it's what I want, and and it's a it's an idea I think is really good, and we would have seen proper space jockeys then, because if you look at it, you know, if you look at Prometheus, if you look at the the space jockey in the ship, or rather the shell that the engineers climb inside to become the pilot, there's a huge discrepancy of the size of Ian White to the size of the space jockey that we see in Alien. You know, it's a it's a vastly huge creature, and I I came up with something to explain that, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something in it that's so good. I hope that maybe if Fox calls me or Marvel calls me or something, maybe I'll do something for them. 
Something I'm really curious about from your point of view as a writer is typical presence of a team up in an Alien vs. Predator story. I'm always iffy on this, and I'm particularly iffy on the way it was done in, in Anderson's film. Mm-hmm. But when you were working on yours, was that a story element that you sort of had to think about? Were you conscious of how do I make this work? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, the, the, the predator is there to, to hunt the aliens. The humans are in the, the, the humans on their own are their own prey for, you know, some predators. There were elements in the comic that didn't sit well with me. I didn't much like the attack on the, although it works great on the page. And that's down to Phil Norwood, you know, who's a storyboard artist in his own right. You know, the artwork I thought was spectacular. He worked on AVP, actually. He worked on Amazon. He did. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I love the hover bikes, but I didn't like the attack on that rancher's house. It worried me. And, you know, I do like the predator ethical code. I do like the fact that they won't, you know, the girl in, in Predator 2, she's pregnant, even though she's armed, she's pregnant and the Predator lets her go. Or, you know, you, you lose. I mean, yeah, I mean, we could talk about this all day, but I, I do. I, I think that humans were just an inconvenience. That It was like the Predators turned up in my drive and it's like and the Predators are like, oh, hey, what's this? Oh, no, there's a facility. Right. Well, we still got a job to do. And, you know, the girl was just sort of in the way. And, you know, the, the Predator just tolerated her yeah you know i mean it, it was like you know she's there as long as she's not an impediment she can be here but really you know it's not a team up in it. it's like yeah it's like yeah you want to follow me follow me what was the film you know we ain't partners we ain't friends and that was it and if i was approaching it again now i would probably push that even further it was a shame at the end of alien versus predator you know given that that was the movie that was going to be made of it, that Zoe Saldana did not go off with the Predators at the end. I would have liked to have seen that. Yeah, but it's fine, because she'll return in AEP Annihilation. Oh, as it said at the end of <laughs> yeah. that, that draft. Yeah. Yes, yes. I tell people about that and they don't believe it. It's it's in the scanned version online. The, there is evidence of oh, it. Oh, is it? Yeah. Excellent. Oh, good, yeah. Uh, Lex will return in AVP to a. <laughs> I remember back in the day, in the 90s, reading through the book, which I think has been reprinted recently, Dissecting Aliens. And I think that was I've one of the first. Book. I've never seen oh, it. Yeah, until you yeah. told me about this, I, I had no idea that yeah. this thing occurred. He got um, quite a reputation because it also went on to de- detail some stuff about resurrection at the time before that had come out. Interesting. Uh, there you go. I've never read it. That's the, what the cover of it looks like. Oh, I like. beg your yeah. pardon. I, I have read it. I've totally there you go. read it. John C. Flynn. Yes, I bet. You know, until you showed it to me again. Yeah, I've got a copy of that. Yes, yeah, I have well, read it. Remind me. This has been a very long time. I remember I took some issue with some of the, the facts in there that weren't factual. Yeah. Well, they, I, th- I think it was one of the first which did detail there was this zero G sequence in the second draft, interestingly. Oh, did it? I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, unless my memory is going, but I, that's how I remember it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can you though, remember the first time you noticed your project being mentioned and starting to think to yourself, this thing's starting to gain a reputation now. It, it's it's growing bigger than just a job. It's it's gaining notoriety. No, I don't. I don't, I don't remember at all. I, I remember somebody, I think Alan Jones inter- asked if he could interview me for City Fantastique. And then Stephen Nelms asked if he could interview me for Starlog Platinum magazine. So the, the, certainly those two interviews that were around about 90, 92, 93, I guess. But, I, I, you know, it's taken its own life over the years. You know, I, I guess when it started to crop up in screenwriting books, there was a book by Chris Gore called The 50 Greatest Screenplays Never Made. And, you know, there was a thing from Kubrick and there was a thing from David Lean. And, and then there's my script in there, which is kind of, it's a very bizarre thing to sort of see that and then uh, Dave Hughes I think did the greatest sci- 50 greatest sci-fi movies never made in his first edition of that and that was in the then it appeared in a, a book called How Not to Write a Screenplay and there was a I think I on, have that yeah there was a chapter on action writing which uh, it had Shane Black's Lethal Weapon and it had My Alien versus Predator sort of examples of how to write action scenes in it 
I guess it was sort of a cumulative effect. It was in a lot of books and a lot of magazine articles. And then I guess it finally ended up on the internet, scanned and, and pirated. And it was weird. I mean, I've met people, guys like, you know, Zach Stentz, who, who wrote Thor, who said, you know, that, that when they were in college and they were trying to make it in the film industry, they would sort of like read this and it would be sort of like inspirational to people to prove that, you know, you could write a script and get it sold and, and break the Hollywood system. So that's always gratifying to kind of see that people liked it for that reason. But I think the weirdest thing was I was with Steve Norrington back in the early 90s, and I, I knew Steve from a, a commercials company in London. There was a an exhibition in the basement of Tower Records for some reason. I think it was probably an Aliens video release, and Steve and I were, they had one of the smart guns on display, and I bought a magazine and I went to, to, ch- to the checkout to pay. For it. I pulled out my credit card and I gave it to the guy. And the guy looked at my credit card and looked at me and he went, are you the Peter Briggs? <laughs> and I had done, I mean, you know, it, it was years after this until I'd done anything that was, had been made. And that was a weird moment for me that to be known for a script that has never been made, it's an odd thing. And honestly, I'd rather people knew me for the stuff that has been made, but those are the breaks. And it, it's got a life of its own. Even now, I mean, this year, I've been approached for things connected to this script that I can't really talk about at the moment for reasons that have to do with lawsuits and things. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, it's it's an odd one. It's an odd one. It's nice that people still like it. But, you know, it was a script that a very young guy wrote in a very short period of time as an act of desperation in, to try and get a job and break into the film industry. And that it's gone beyond that is a nice thing. But, you know, I think you have to just look at it on that basis. But, you know, if you're a fan of the script, thank you for liking it. Yeah, I, I remember one interview you said you were, I think, at a party or, or something and you'd heard or you found that somebody had actually, like, translated it into German and this would have been oh, before yeah, the days yeah. of Google Trends. Really, Someone would have really manually had somebody to somebody had to sit down and manually yeah. do that. Unfortunately my knowledge of German is not that great so I couldn't say whether it was an accurate <laughs> translation or not. But um yeah that is the case. It's it's a peculiar one. So through your later work on Hellboy, you developed a relationship with the folk at Dark Horse. Did you ever discuss you, this script with um, Mike Richardson and Randy Stradley? I've never met Randy. I know that Randy, who I understand, is, I think he's retired now, uh, as I understand. Randy was annoyed with me for many years, and, and quite rightly too. You know, I took his baby and I ripped it off and got a lot of acclaim for it. And, you know, I've apologised to Randy several times in print, and I can't say enough, you know, without Randy Stradley. I wouldn't have a career. Mike became, uh, I became friendly with around the time I, God, when did I first meet Mike? I'm not sure. I think I met him in, in Portland, Oregon when I was doing Hellboy in 1996. And Mike and I definitely talked about Alien versus Predator. And again, at that time, nothing was happening with it. And, you know, Mike and I, our paths crossed several times over the years. In fact, you know, I, I remember about 96, he asked me if I'd like to write comics for Dark Horse. And I said that I, you know, very much would like to do that. Um, unfortunately, nothing ever came of it, which is a shame. I actually just wrote my first comic a year ago, which was for um, uh, Rebellion in England. And you know, Mike, Mike and I met at the Hellboy premiere and uh, we, we bumped into each other at, at various Comic Cons. And I remember saying to him, hey, Mike, I've come up with a really great idea for Alien versus Predator versus Terminator. And he laughed at me. And then a few years later, they brought out Alien versus Predator versus Terminator. Such a bad comic. It's... Oh, you should have seen the story I wanted to do. It was great. <laughs> So you have alluded to this, and I'm sure you're probably not going to want to go into too much detail, but I've got to ask you because uh-huh. it's, it's criminal of me not to. So you had this really unique experience of seeing all the previous work that was that was done on EBP as part of the sure part of the the arbitration stuff. And until I think it was last year, until you mentioned this Thomas Brothers treatment, mm-hmm. we, nobody'd ever heard of this. I think I have read it in a, in a magazine somewhere, a paragraph about it, but um, I don't remember what the magazine was. But it was a crash predator ship in, I think, Tibet. And there was a, I think it was probably something like Sci-Fi Universe or, or something like that. And they, there was a, a billionaire who wanted to prolong his life using predator technology. I thought that was the Fox and Demonico one. No, okay. there is no Fox and Demonico one. Okay. There is not. It's not simply not true. Okay. We had the material. 
I didn't read the material. I saw a, you know, a thumbnail outline of it. I can't really go in because I don't think I'm allowed to go into the, the arbitration process. But uh, the Thomas brothers were the only other people who actually produced material legitimately, and it was a, a very short treatment. So yeah, that's, that that was what always got attributed to those guys. So that's interesting that that was actually yeah, yeah that was no, actually that's, the Thomas that's, brothers. That's the Thomas brothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, my my feeling is that that's where Wayland came from in the Anderson script. Could have been, actually, yeah. So while not through anything related to Alien, you did get to meet and know John Hurt. Can you tell us a little about that experience? Sure. I mean, you know, John, I I knew because of Hellboy, because John obviously plays Professor Broom, Hellboy's earthly father in the film. We we had several boozy nights out, and uh, (laughs) I cannot actually tell you what John is. Any preconception you have of John Hurt is not what John Hurt is like. He is boisterous and loud and funny and friendly and can probably drink you under the table and will regale you with anecdotes about everything and do Shakespeare on the the turn of a a, a moment. (laughs) And yeah, no, he was lovely. And and I do remember him saying to me, I said, so John, what, what brought you to Professor Broom? And he was like, well, of course, I've never really <laughs> gone into doing this kind of genre before. And I said, but well, you did Alien. And he goes, well, yes, but, you know, that was classy. And I said, <laughs> and, and you did The Ghoul. And he went, yeah, well, that's so long ago, I, I can't really remember that. <laughs> but he has done these things, but space balls. You know. But no, lovely guy. That's a great impression, by the way. It hurts your throat. Don't try and do it at home, kids. <laughs> that's that's brilliant. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm too busy laughing at that. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to treatments, not an AVP, well, not even a treatment, I suppose it's a pitch. Not AVP, but you once told Bloody Disgusting that you tried to pitch a Predator film to Joel Silver. I didn't try to, I did. I pitched it. It was in 1998 at their offices on Warner Brothers. It was a general meet and greet. They wanted to know, you know, what projects I had. So I did the dog and pony act and trotted through them all. And I said, look, you know, what I really want to do is a Predator sequel. Although I know a version of it was done in one of the Dark Horse comics, it was not the version I wanted to do, which was a story of where the Predator 2 flintlock came from. And so I basically had a situation where there were, it was kind of, you know, the Spanish main and there were buccaneers and there were Royal Navy ships and this. This predator had sort of been involved watching a conflict from up in the yardarm of a pitched battle at sea and watching these two guys go at each other. It's been 20 something years since I pitched this thing, so I could barely remember it myself. But the, the predator basically turned up in London and started killing off the crew of this captain's crew to goad him into having a fight with the other guy. And the other guy turns up, and, you know, in front, the two of them are in France together, and they realize that they're being manipulated. So it's these two guys who have been manipulated. It's a totally a period film. And I hadn't really thought a great deal of it out and it was very wild and woolly but that's basically the story that that's another one of those things that people have been asking for as well they want that film of the pistol you know it's a natural we, we want the film of the pistol what i what i want is i want 20th century fox to let me be the showrunner on a series where we have 10 15 short stories each set in a different time period Mm. Yes, that'd be brilliant. It w- it would work so well for an anthology. Predator is so flexible. Yep, it lends itself to everything. It, you know, there was well, again, it's something I can't talk about. But I was approached to do a Predator story set in a different era. But the ongoing Thomas Brothers thing is a, is a bit tricky. We'll have to see how that resolves. Watch this space. Yeah. So as, as we're coming up to the last sort of few questions, I know you've talked a little bit about it, but I, I've got to ask you, it's a natural thing to ask is, overall, what did you think of Anderson's AVP? Weirdly enough, I think I was more caustic of it originally. I've sort of mellowed on it over the years. I mean, it's certainly far better than Alien vs. Predator Requiem, which is such a missed opportunity, which is a shame as well, because, you know, I, I think that the Predator, the Wolf Predator in Alien vs. Predator Requiem is a really strong character and comes across as really strong. But again, you can't see him because the image is so damn dark. I like elements of Anderson's draft. I mean, I think where it becomes unglued is in the, the human relationships and the fact that, that those stories are quite vanilla. But when you get into the, you know, when you get into the the actual fights, the actual alien versus predator itself, I mean, that 
the first you know, the Celtic predator that fight in the temple. You know, I, the McFarlane figure moment where you have the the alien being thrown through the pillar. All of that stuff, you know, is just so good. I mean, there's an array of interesting weaponry that Anderson created for it. It's just it's remarkably short, and I have logic gaps issues with it. And one of the, one of the things that really does annoy me about that film is it's it's in an Antarctica, and you have the predators who we know from the first film only turn up when it's really really hot and they're still walking around in the in the camouflage netting and and they're not even wearing a fur you know they're not wearing a suit i mean you know, i'm surprised those things didn't even freeze to death out there in the snow and there is no logical explanation for that that just really annoys me but yeah it's well directed it's well photographed it's got a nice score the effects are terrific the predator is is engaging it's perfectly fine it could have been better but it's not Alien versus Predator Requiem, which again is just even more frustrating because there's so much to like in that. There's just, but essentially it's it's a pizza boy versus <laughs> a monster of the week. Yeah, and there's just no getting around that. You know, I mean, we, we've still yet to see what the ramifications of the Utani shoulder cannon in my mind, if I was retconning that, it would be that Utani, you know, never really kind of did anything other than figure out some technological leaps forward. And then they become the primary creators of hyperdrives and are, you know, swallowed up by Wayland, become Wayland Utani. And there we go. That's how you move forward with that. So uh, opinions then on the film aside, I think it's fair to say that your legacy as the first writer, you know, you are you are intrinsically involved in, in, in AVP overall. And I think it gives you a bit of a soft spot for it as well. And that is a soft spot that is not shared by the alien queen Sigourney Weaver, which seems, yes. seems to have caused a bit of headbutting between yourselves online. So what's what's that? It's a red flag to a bull. I mean, I think I understand where Sigourney's coming from because, you know, the thing you have to realize is that the franchise is not called is not called Ripley. It's called Alien. And honestly, we don't need alien movies with Sigourney Weaver in, no matter what the fanboys on Twitter who, you know, are like, oh, Neil Blomkamp is going to bring back Ripley. It's going to be so great. We want to see alien stories. We don't necessarily need to see Ripley stories. And if you've followed 30 years of Dark Horse comic books, uh, you can you can see where you could go with this franchise if you have the vision and if you have the imagination to take it there. When you don't, you end up with Prometheus and Alien Covenant. I don't agree that, you know, as, as some people have said, that the Alien franchise is washed up and done with. The Alien franchise hasn't even started yet. The Predator franchise needs more good installments. And when everyone goes, oh, it could be Alien versus Predator. Well, Alien versus Predator could be great. It could be really great if it's given the opportunity. Damn right. But the thing is, you have to hire people who know what they're doing. Yes. Um, not necessarily talking about my script. We're talking about both writers and directors. I was surprised when I read the Cinefix article on Alien vs. Predator Requiem that the Strauss brothers admit in that article uh, on the, like the, almost the first page that they were considering adapting my draft, you know, and it was like nobody ever talked to me about this at the time. I mean, weirdly, before Alien vs. Predator came out, they had to buy the draft off me a second time because they had the rights for 10 years and the rights elapsed. And when they were doing the uh, the legal part of uh, of it before Anderson's movie started. They had to come to me, which is how I found out that the movie was going ahead, and buy the draft off me a second time. So that was a nice payday that I wasn't expecting. So thank you, Paul. But yeah, the, the Strauss brothers were, were potentially thinking of doing this and then decided to go the earth route so i don't know would they have been able to pull it off i i don't know probably not on the budget yeah that's Def definitely definitely not i mean the great thing about both those movies about alien versus predator and alien versus predator requiem is that they are made on very finite budgets i mean they're made on budgets that are a fraction of what ridley was given for covenant and mm -hmm. and prometheus and imagine what you could achieve with an alien versus predator movie if you had the, the covenant of prometheus budget particularly now i mean you know not just necessarily with digital effects but look how far we've come in the last year and a half with the mandalorian with the stagecraft volume if you were making my script you know uh, and making my ryushi kind of station how easy would that be now with scan models unreal engine created uh, digital effects and a background that's being rendered in real time with the actors i mean it just it opens up an entire new realm of possibility for this franchise and, you know, I'm excited to see where that goes, provided you have people at the helm who understand what they're doing. These days, because it's been a while since the AVP thing, for those of us who have sort of like, you know, followed your stuff, 
no interview would really be complete without talking about Mortis Rex and Mortis Rex, Panzer yeah. 88. Now, yeah. for those of us, you out two, there... Two more troubled uh, productions. Yes. I mean, I mean, I've gone through, you know, I sold Alien vs. Predator. So I worked on Judge Dredd, Stallone version, um, which was a nightmare that put me in hospital. Freddy yeah. vs. Jason, Hellboy, War of the Worlds with Kenneth Branagh and Tom Cruise. Then, boy, I worked on a Highlander film for a Dimension that didn't happen. Lots of projects that people wouldn't know about, some adaptations of things. And in 2005, I was working on a movie with Stan Lee and Robert Evans called Forever Man at Paramount. And that was the point where I decided I had enough of going through the development hell process. And I tried to get two projects of my own off the ground as a producer. And I worked with, on the first one, which was Mortis Rex, I worked with a producer called Jim Jacks. And Jim was the producer who gave Sam Raimi his first shot at Universal. He also produced produced Tombstone, produced the Mummy movies with Sean Daniels. And we were putting that movie together from about 2008 to 2000. I'm forgetting when this was, 2012, I think. And unfortunately, Jim had a heart attack and died. So that was really the, we had half the financing in place of it. It was a story that was set in 123 AD in Scotland. And the Romans are building Hadrian's Wall and they're building it in sections. And then they come to join it up. And this remote out post called Brigham Magna in the middle of nowhere is building their section of the wall and something big and nasty and tentacled is killing off their men. And so that was Mortis Rex and it's been put on the back burner because I started at the same time, there was a crossover between them, which was Panzer 88, which I was making with Gary Kurtz, producer of Star Wars and Power Strikes Back and Dark Crystal and Return to Oz and American Graffiti. And I brought on board Ivor Powell, the executive producer of Alien and a big friend of mine for many, many years. And we had fully got the financing together in 2017 on this. It was a supernatural movie about a German tank crew being chased by a Jewish golden in World War II. The new version of it, which collapsed in 2017, Gary was diagnosed with cancer and after going through chemotherapy, again, sadly died. And Ivor sold a, a film of his, which I gave him some notes on, called Bios, to two guys you may have heard of, Spielberg and Zemeckis, and they and Ivor had to leave the project and go off and make that with Tom Hanks, and that's been sitting in a can for for a year because of COVID and I, it was sold to Apple a few weeks ago. I'm not sure if it's going to get a theatrical release, but it's certainly going to get a, an Apple streaming release. It's a really, really good script and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. But Panzer 88 has been retooled. I'm just about to finish the new draft. We've been talking to some financiers, but it's, it's reworked now as a sort of still guys in the German tank, but it's now a, a sort of spy mission behind enemy lines that goes awry when an alien gets involved. Yeah, I think fans of Predator will kind of enjoy it because there's there's nods in that direction. Yeah, I mean, both of them from the concept art I've seen, there's, I could be wrong on this, but I got a very much like a Warhammer vibe from what definitely. I saw of the concept no, that, that was That was definitely the intention when we were designing the mm. feature. And that's that's carried through to the, the new retooling. So, yeah, I like the characters a lot more in the new draft. But I do regret that we weren't able to make the version about the German tank crew because I think that was a novel concept. Yeah. And I think that the supernatural version, the supernatural elements in that particular story were great. But there were some rights issues with the original writers. And so the new draft doesn't use any of the material. It uses the material I created for for the later drafts and reworks it and yeah I, i'm looking forward to seeing where i could go with it it's still too early on on this new draft for me to talk about it i mean would you consider if it's still both of them still get held up possibly like gibson's alien 3 got turned into a comic going the comic or animation feature route perhaps on which one well, either of them, if if they if they still you know for whatever reason no. get hold no, up. No, these, or... these, these are these are perfectly good. So, I mean, look, these are two movies that I've been working on now for thirteen years. Which is yeah. you know when, when when people say to me, so what happened to Peter Briggs? Well, this is this is what happened to Peter Briggs. He got held up working on two films for thirteen years. I went down to New Zealand, um, met with Peter Jackson. Peter sat with me, and we went over the concept art. And Peter looked at it and he said, look, you know, I want to help you make this here in New Zealand in any way I can. And that was sort of the 
the plan at, at that point. We could have made it in, in various places. We had some South African financing, but I just couldn't make the film at that time in South Africa. What has changed, as we've just talked about, has been the Mandalorian volume stagecrafting, where now, you know, I can make a movie set against an icy backdraft an uh, icy backdrop in the middle of South Africa on a soundstage. It's yeah. now doable, which it wasn't, you know, several years ago. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing where we go with that. You know, I, I did, I wrote, because I went to workshop, were involved. In fact, Richard Taylor met me at Comic-Con in 2010 or 2011, I think it was. And I'd approached him to do the creatures for initially for Panzer 88. And then I gave him Mortis Rex to read on the flight over to Los Angeles. And I met up with him in San Diego and we talked about Panzer 88. And I said, Richard, so you haven't really talked about Mortis Rex. He said to me, that's what he kind of blew me away. He said, well, I'd kind of like to come on board and produce these movies with you. And, you know, this is a, I don't know how many Oscars Richard's won, certainly more than a, a dozen. But Richard was on board the film as a producer. And then because it it didn't look like The Hobbit was going to happen. And then suddenly The Hobbit turned from two movies to three movies. And unfortunately, we lost Richard as a producer. But, you know, Richard has been unstintingly supportive of the project for the last decade. The last decade. God, that kills me to even hear that. When the time is right in the next few weeks, I hope I'll be talking to him again about the current draft. I understand. Well, I mean, New Zealand is one of the few places right now where you can make a movie. You know, they have several of these volume sound stages that have gone up around Wellington and, and other places. So it certainly is a possibility. I know the guys I'm talking to for financing would like to get Netflix involved. And we'll see. You know, all of this is all very hypothetical right now. You know, it's just a shame that I, I lost both of my producers on this one to, yeah. to Mortality and Steven Spielberg. <laughs> There, I did notice on the um, Panzer 88 Facebook page, there's like a marketing video, Panzer 88 Forest Chase Second Half. Does, uh, this yeah. is essentially a storyboard sequence set to music and sound it, effects. But it's, I an, noticed... it's an animatic I put together with a fantastic storyboard artist called Chris Weston, who actually won an award for some costume design he did on Last Jedi. Yeah, and I put together an animatic from Chris's, right. Chris's storyboards. I did notice it. I mean, I could be wrong on this, but I'm sure I noticed there were music and sound effects from Anderson's AVP movie. And I didn't know, was that an intentional reference to your past not, involvement not sound, in that? Not or? sound effects. Yes, m okay. yes uh, music. And no, it's just simply because right. it was appropriate. I mean, there's, um, there's some music from Captain America in there. There's a little bit of music from Alien in there. There's a little bit of music from Alien vs. Predator in there. There's lots of it. But yes, the, I think that the principal music was uh, was uh, Harold Close's score to Alien vs. Predator. That was just basically uh, just, just to put together a, a sequence. Yeah, it uh, works really well as a as a thing. It really does give you an essence of what that could be about. Thanks. That's one of um, several action sequences in the film. That's a forest chase. There's an ice chase. There's a, oh, wow, there's, there's a lot of action in this film. That's actually it. That's everything no more questions from us <laughs> great in a marathon before we sign off it's just yeah i always like to give this opportunity as well is there anything you'd like to say any thought or anecdote that we just haven't given you the opportunity to express with our questions so far no i think we've covered everything man i think it's i think we i, I don't think there's any more alien versus predator stories to be told yeah I, I, did, did i finish off the sigourney weaver thing i can't remember um i don't think there's really anything to be told there anyway but yeah no, the friend that franchise is called alien it's not called ripley <laughs> Predator? No, I think I'm all good on Predator. So we've tapped you out. Yeah, yeah, I think we're done, guys. So is there any particular place that if people want to have your services or learn more about you that they should be looking at? Well, you can always grab me through my agent, which is always easy to find. 20th Century Fox, if you're listening, uh, I'm available. I also do some script consultancy, so you can find me through scriptreaderpro.com. If you have a screenplay, you need some assistance on it. And I have the time right now. I'm kind of, I've spent some time off where I've been working on this draft of my own. But where I can, I try to help writers with their work. And you can always find me through Twitter, where I'm the Peter Briggs at twitter.com. And there you go. Well, if you'd like to find out more about our outlet as well, you know, a hub of our activity is avpgalaxy.net and tentacles are spread everywhere. So all the, all the normal socials you'll find us on as either avpgalaxy or alien versus predator galaxy versus as in vs. 
dot. Peter, thank you so much for taking all this time to come and talk to a bunch of nerds on the internet. Well, I'm a nerd myself, or I'm, I'm a fanboy anyway. You know, I don't use geek. I refuse to use geek. But no, it's been a pleasure because, you know, I don't think I've talked this, you know, I've talked a lot about this project, but I think this is probably the most exhaustively I've talked about it. And uh, yeah, no, keep up the good work, guys. We need to see an Alien versus Predator movie. Damn right. Damn right. Absolutely. Come on, Fox. I was still waiting for that bloody anime. I want to know what that fucking thing was. <laughs> Hidden away somewhere. And they never approached me. I could have written that one. There you go. You see, that that, that was that was one of the questions, but I was like, no, actually, that's going to have been a no, isn't it? But yeah, uh, it was one of the things we were under. It was like, what, what the fuck have they adapted? What have they done? Was it Peter? No. No, no it, it would have been Peter. great, wouldn't it? Yeah. But no, it wasn't me. It definitely wasn't me. Uh, Fox, come on. Give it. Uh, well, studios, sorry. Give it. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been Aaron Percival. Eric Adams. And this is Kane. Where's my damn prequel? <laughs> <laughs> this is Peter Briggs. Thank you for listening. <laughs>